guys, we're going to talk about chapter two, and this is going to look at classical views of leadership and management. And this chapter is focused on theory development for each the leadership and management role and how each of these roles are integrated within each other. Classical views of leadership and management means the need to develop nursing leadership skills has never been greater than it is today. Um, and we can ask ourselves, what contemporary factors are driving this need for nursing leadership skills? So let's dive into this chapter and discuss how leadership and management has changed through time. And I think you'll even notice how management and leadership has changed even since COVID. Um, so let's just dive in and see what we could talk about. When we think about the management process, it does include planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling. And we'll work through each of these. Let's look at the difference between leaders and managers. Leaders tend to look toward the future, imagining the possibilities and setting those into motion, um, things that go um, in that direction. So they empower others. They maximize that workforce effectiveness. Um, they are really needed to implement the planned change that is part of system improvement. Managers um, are usually more focused on today's work. So you can see the difference there. Leaders are future, futuristic, right? Managers are today. Um, how are the current goals, objectives, outcomes, how are those being met? So they guide, direct, and motivate others. They intervene um, if those goals are being threatened and they really emphasize that control. Leaders take risks and inspire others to act. Leaders do not force anyone to follow them, but rather those who follow do so by choice. And I think if you can think about somebody that you've um, looked at as a leader, right, um, you choose to follow them because you see those leadership um, aspects in them. Leadership is more dynamic than management, but leaders that make mistakes can result in loss of those followers. I think you could probably also come up with a scenario in your head when you're following someone that was a really great leader and then you see a mistake and you're like, oh, maybe that's not the best person to follow, right? So then you really kind of lose, you, you take away that choice and they lose those followers. A job title alone does not make a person a leader, only a person's behavior determines if he or she occupies that leadership position. Often um, leaders do not have delegated authority, but they obtain their power through other means. Um, they have a wider, rate, wider variety of roles than managers and may have different personal goals. They're frequently not part of a formal organization and they focus on group process, information gathering, feedback, and empowering others. So how do you recognize a leader? It's not by their location. A leader can be out in front, they can be in the middle, they could even be following behind. Uh, you recognize a leader by the response of their followers. So when we think about managers, components of managers include that they're assigning those positions within the organization. Um, they usually have a legitimate source of power um, due to that delegated authority that accompanies that position. They're expected to carry out specific functions. Um, we've already talked about emphasizing that control, decision making, decision analysis, and results. They can manipulate people. They can manipulate the environment, money, time, other resources to try to get to those goals for the organization. They have a greater formal responsibility and accountability for rationality and control than the leader position. And they direct willing and unwilling subordinates. So I hope you can see the difference in who a leader looks like and what a manager looks like. This slide gives just additional characteristics of each of the leader and the manager and how successful each role plays in determining the quality 
of each roll. So I'm not going to read through each of those. I'll let you look at those. But again, it's just those differences in uh, your leadership role versus your manager role. So ultimately, the final management process included planning, organizing staff, directing, and controlling. And this framework can be utilized really in any organization. So let's look at a description for each of these functions. So when we think about planning, this is the first phase of management process. It encompasses determining the philosophy, the goals, objectives, policies, procedures, and rules. Um, we're going to carry out those long and short range projections. And then we're going to determine a fiscal course of action and then manage that planned change. This phase is where a proactive and deliberate leader or manager decides in advance what to do, who's going to do it, how, when, and where is it going to be done, and it involves those choices um, that need to be made. When we think about organizing, this is the second phase of the management process. Relationships are defined, procedures are outlined, equipment is readied, and tasks are now assigned. So this includes establishing the structure to carry out those plans, determining the most appropriate type of patient care delivery, and grouping activities in order to meet those unit goals. This may include asking people early in the process to help policies and the aspects of how those policies are gonna form. Other functions involve working with the structure of the organization and understanding and using power and authority appropriately. Staffing is that third phase of the management process. The manager recruits, selects, orients and promotes personnel development to accomplish the goals of the organization. Scheduling, staff development, employee socialization, and team building are also often included as a staff function. Directing is that fourth phase, also referred to as the coordinating or activating. Um, in this doing phase of management, managers direct the work of subordinates. So this usually entails um, human resource management responsibilities, such as motivating, managing conflict, delegating, communicating, and facilitating collaboration. If conflict occurs with staff regarding, let's say, long lunch breaks, this is the phase that the manager steps in to resolve that conflict. And then the final phase is controlling. And in this phase, performance is measured um, against those predetermined standards. Action is taken to correct any discrepancies between the standards and the actual performance that happens. So this is gonna include our um, performance appraisals, fiscal accountability, um, control, uh, quality control, legal and ethical control, and then professional collegial control. So let's work through some of the historical development of management theory. We know that organizations are complex, which means that successful management theories have really evolved throughout the history to meet those complex standards. Theorists' view of what successful management is and what it should be have changed repeatedly in the last hundred years. So we are going to look at um, the different development uh, theorists, and you can see those listed here, and we'll just go through each one of those. The first one we're going to look at is the scientific management that was utilized in the 1900s to 1930s and was discovered or developed by Frederick W. Taylor. Frederick W. Taylor was known as the father of scientific management. Four principles were identified by Taylor and those were traditional rule of thumb, meaning organizational work must be replaced with scientific methods. Time and motion with expertise workers promoting that efficiency of time and energy. Scientific personnel system is established so that workers can be hired, they can be trained, and they can be promoted based on the competencies and their abilities. And this really helped match workers to the appropriate jobs. And then the other one, last one is workers fit into that organization by contributing common goals, shared ideas, 
and knowing the organization mission, the right fit will be found. These ideas um, also helped introduce financial incentives for accomplishing work that had been completed. Relationships between managers and workers was cooperative and interdependent, meaning work was equally shared, but the roles were defined differently. So as nurses, we should think about work routines that are carried out in our organizations. And if you can spot any inefficiencies, could time and motion involved in carrying out some of these tasks be altered in order to improve efficiency without jeopardizing the quality of care? And I just challenge you, right, um, to see if you can point out any of those efficiencies. Um, take those to your leaders, take those to your managers, and see if those um, any alterations could be made to make things more efficient um, so that quality of care can be improved. As Taylor was examining worker tasks, Max Weber was looking to study large scale organizations to determine what made some workers more efficient than others. Weber proposed that bureaucracy as an organization design and perceived a need to provide more rules regulations and structure within organizations and then that is what would increase the efficiency the human relations era was from about 1930 to 1970s and it developed the concept of participatory and human humanistic management emphasizing people rather than the machines that we operate mary parker follett was one of the first theorists to suggest basic principles of what today would uh, be called participative, participative decision-making or participative management. She believed that managers should have authority with rather than over employees, meaning solutions could be discovered and satisfy both the manager and employee without having one side dominate over the other. This era also discovered that when management paid special attention to workers, productivity increased, really regardless of the environment. And this was called the Hawthorne effect because this discovery occurred while studying the Hawthorne works of the Western Electric Company near Chicago. And we'll talk a little bit more about that Hawthorne effect here shortly. Douglas McGregor reinforced these ideas by directly correlating manager attitude toward employees with employee satisfaction. He labeled this theory X and theory Y. Theory X managers believe that their employees are basically lazy, they need constant supervision, and they are indifferent to the organizational needs. Theory Y on the other hand, managers believed their workers enjoyed their work. They were self-motivated and they were willing to work hard to meet those personal and organizational goals. So you can see Douglas had that kind of trust versus mistrust um, theory X, theory Y. And then Elton Mayo and his colleagues discovered that when management paid special attention to workers, productivity increased regardless again of that environment. And this was considered the Hawthorne effect, which we've already kind of hit on. And this really indicated that people respond to the fact that they are being studied there and they are attempting to increase whatever behavior they feel will continue to warrant that positive attention that they're going to get. There are several emerging theories that have been around since 1970s, <coughs> excuse me, that are developing the leadership role. So let's look at a few of these. Because strong management skills were historically valued more than strong leadership skills, the study of leadership did not really begin until the 20th century. As history has progressed, the focus has moved from traits and behaviors of leaders to how leaders engage in the organization, as well as with their followers. The great man theory or trait theory states that some people are born to lead, whereas others are born to be led. It also suggests that great leaders will arise 
when the situation demands it. Have you ever noticed just about yourself, right? A situation comes up, no one's taking charge. Are you that person that takes the lead um, as a great man trait theory, right? Are you that leader when the situation arise or are you that leader that was born to lead? Um, so different um, theories um, suggest different ways of leading. So we must ask ourselves, are leaders born or are they made? As legendary American football coach Vince Lombardi once said, leaders aren't born, they are made. And they are made just like anything else through hard work. So I think you just need to ask yourself this question and come up with your own um, thoughts about it. Leadership skills can be learned, although some individuals have certain characteristics or personality traits that may make it easier for them to assume that leadership role. So again, we're asking ourselves, are leaders born or are they made? Um, and so now we can see that perhaps leaders are both born and made that way. Behavioral theories isolated common leadership styles and grouped them into um, authoritarian leader, democratic leader, laissez-faire leader. So when we think about those behavioral um, leadership styles, and we think about the authoritarians, these are characterized by strong control over the work group, coercion, commands, downward communication, a single decision maker, emphasis on the status and punitive and criticisms. When we think about authoritarian leadership, we may think of someone like our armed forces. Democratic leaders have moderate control, motivation using economic and ego awards, they direction versus suggestion and guidance, interactive communication, not that downward, right, or interactive communication through group decision making and constructive criticism. And then our laissez-faire leadership styles characterized by minimal control, um, the least control um, in this style. Motivation occurs rarely, right, they're not going to motivate you, um, and it's only really going to motivate you if the group requests to be motivated. There's little or no direction or interactive communication. They, there's dispersed decision making um, and then the group emphasis um, is a lack of criticism. So you can see the different styles there. So you can also go back and think about um, your management on your units or your uh, management in previous jobs, right? Were they authoritative? Were they democratic? or were they laissez-faire? And just try to determine the differences in those, in those three styles. When we think about situational or contingency leadership, this suggests that no one leadership style is ideal for every situation. And I think you could probably also see that in your leadership, right? Everybody's different. Um, every situation is different. Um, so there's gonna be differences as we move through as leaders and managers. Contingency theory states that there are three levels of leadership action, group, individual, and task levels. Each of these levels has its own needs. Good leaders are aware of this and they are able to adapt their style to the needs of the level they are working on. So for example, when you're working with an individual staff member, say you're giving them feedback on their individual patients. You behave slightly different when you're talking with a group of your staff, right? In fact, you probably wouldn't give feedback to an individual in a group setting because that's too personal. These changes or the way you adapt your behavior when you're working on a task, interacting with an individual or interacting with a group form the basis of contingency theory. Interrelationships between the group leader and its members were most influenced by managers' ability to be a good leader. Key variables included the task to be accomplished, as well as the power associated with the leader's position. Interactional leadership 
theory states that the behavior of the leader is determined by the relationship between the leader's personality and the situation. Humans are complex beings and working environments need to have an open system for response, meaning a set of objects with a relationship between the objects and their attributes. When we think about transactional and transformational leadership, we're actually, give me a second, we'll get to that one. Um, the last one we're gonna talk about is that full range leadership theory. Um, these are leaders that, leaders that can apply principle of transformational, transactional, and laissez-faire at any given time. So you can go back to that behavioral theories, full range leaderships, they, kinda, they can disperse those different styles really at any time. Okay, so let's go back to transactional and transformational. Um, this slide shows the components of a transactional leader. Transactional leaders are individuals that lead by focusing on the day-to-day -day operations and management tasks of an organization. They are also called a traditional leader. Okay, so you can see um, kind of those components. Focuses on management tasks, directive and results oriented, uses trade-offs to meet goals, does not identify shared values, examines causes, and uses contingency as rewards. That's your transactional leader. On the flip side, transformational leader, um, this transformation theory builds on situational and contingency theories. This slide shows the components for trans transformational leaders, identifies common values, is a caretaker, inspires others with a vision, has long-term vision, looks at effects, and empowers others. Transformational leaders focus on that vision and that empowerment. Although transformational qualities are highly desirable, they must be coupled with more um, traditional transactional qualities of the day-to-day -day manager role or that leader will fail, right? We can't just be transformational all the time. We can be transactional all the time. If we're gonna be transformational, we have to throw in some day-to-day -day management roles of a transactional leader in order to be a successful leader. Kuzi and Posner are two of the best known authors to further the work of transformational leadership. They suggest that exemplary leaders foster a culture in which relationships between aspiring leaders and willing followers can thrive. This really requires five different practices, modeling, inspiring, challenging, enabling, and encouraging. So when we think about modeling the way, this requires value clarification, self-awareness, so that the behavior is congruent with the values. Inspiring a shared vision entails visioning that inspires followers to want to participate in goal attainment. Challenging the process identifies opportunities and then taking action. Enabling others to act really fosters that collaboration, that trust, and that sharing of power. And then encouraging the heart recognizes, appreciates, and celebrates followers in the achievements of those shared goals. If anyone applies these five practices, they can further their ability to lead others and get extraordinary things done. Full range leadership model, we kind of talked about, right? These are this, those leaders that can really apply different leadership styles and adapt that leadership style as needed, really depending on the situation. Um, and you can kind of see the picture there that depicts different situations. What style am I going to lead with? And that concludes chapter two. If you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or we will chat about it in class. Thanks, guys.